York Energy Week 2024, the epicenter of global energy innovation, where industry leaders, visionaries, and pioneers are gathering to shape the future. This landmark event, now in its 11th year, unites the brightest minds to forge new paths and challenge the conventional boundaries of energy technology and sustainability. So thank you for joining us here on the One Business World platform for this transformative journey that promises to inspire, empower, and catalyze groundbreaking advancements in the energy sector. So next up for us, we are very happy to welcome Hans-Jürgen Walter. He is uh, Deloitte's global leader of sustainable finance. He's joining us this morning from um, New York City, 30 Rock. And his topic is financing the energy transition, strategic investments for a sustainable future. Good morning, Hans. Th welcome and thank you. Good morning, Clan, and thank you very much for the introduction. Look forward to your uh, look forward to your remarks. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, welcome everybody. So, as Klein said, my name is Hans-Jürgen Walter, and um, I'm the global sustainable finance leader at Deloitte. So, focusing on climate and sustainability in the financial sector. So, it's it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on the critical topic, um, and it's indeed critical of financing the energy transition, a strategic investments for a sustainable future. And thanks for joining us. Um, in the next 30 minutes, I will talk about where we stand regarding the financing of the energy transition. I will talk about the reasons why we are collectively behind investment plans. And of course, I will look forward um, uh, to the measures how to get the ball rolling and how to accelerate the financing and implementation of the transition. So let me start with the initial situation. And you discussed this, of course, uh, during the last few days already. but. Reaching collective goals of net zero greenhouse gas emissions globally requires a fundamental transformation to how low carbon or even net zero economy. The core of this goal, the global challenge will be the energy transition as the energy and the energy feedstock use in the key economic sectors account for about 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So reaching climate neutrality in the global energy sector will require investing in a highly renewable and electrified energy systems, which are, for example, expansion of clean electricity, mainly renewables, expansion of the grid infrastructure, which is needed, far reaching electrification of heating and transport, develop of high uh, or green hydrogen energy, electrolyzers for green hydrogen production, energy storage, batteries, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, you name it. So investments in these areas can lead to sustainable value creation and sustainable economic growth. Can. Yes, however, the energy transition is simultaneously associated with increased economic risks, particularly in the areas where new markets are being developed or new technologies are being used, which is the case in most of the things which I mentioned. So much depends on whether we are able to finance the profound transformation to a climate neutral economy. And let's have a look at the investment need. Estimates for how much the global green transition will cost vary greatly ranging from a total of 100 trillion to 200 trillion US dollar between now and 2050, which is 4 trillion to 8 trillion per year. And just to put it into context, the IMF estimate GDP for 2024 is around 110 trillion. So this means that we are talking about an investment need of 4 to 5 or 8 percent of global GDP. This is huge. In the UE, EU Green Deal, though so in Europe, the related European climate and the related European climate law, the EU and its member states have accepted the obligation to reduce uh, net greenhouse gas emissions by uh, to down to 55% uh, by 2030. And this target, and this is important, this is a legally binding target. It's not a wishful thinking that we want to achieve something. It's a law. And if you do not um, achieve your targets, uh, you have to pay penalties. So this is really, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, a legally binding commitment here. And the implementation for the Green Deal in the European Union investment plan, plan assumes investments of one to two trillion US dollar. But regardless of the estimate used, yes, so the message remains the same. Global, European and national capital expenditure will need to rise susten uh, substantially from current levels to uh, limit global warming and mitigate climate risks. To achieve and finance these ambitious goals, governments have outlined clear expectations um, to companies, to the financial sector, and to regulators how to achieve this. 
just to stay in Europe for a second. The EU action plan on sustainable finance, for instance, aims to achieve three key objectives and set clear expectations to the financial sector as an intermediary between uh, investors and the real economy. So the first expectation is that the financial sector redirects capital flows towards sustainable investments to promote sustainable and inclusive growth. The second expectation is that, of course, the financial sector managing financial risks associated with climate change, environmental degradation, uh, degradation and social issues. And last but not least, the third expectation is promoting transparency. Yes, um, and long term thinking in financial and economic activity. So this is all about um, reporting and disclosure and to get the right information in order to take investment decisions. Uh, but with current European and global volumes of investments, just looking at the numbers, the annual investment rate must increase currently approximately five times, which is a huge challenge is to increase the investment rate um, by five times. And if we fail to mobilize capital for the energy transition and the promotion of innovative technologies now, we will most likely not be able to meet the challenge ahead. So the big question, of course, is where does the money comes from? And we all know that the public sector alone cannot shoulder this enormous financial task. So typically it's 10%, which can be financed uh, publicly. And uh, we all know that private investors and private capital must be mobilized to a much greater extent. So the question therefore arises as to which political measures and forms of finance can mobilize additional private capital for the energy transition. We have pursued these questions on financing the energy transition together with energy suppliers, with banks, with investors, with regulators, and with policymakers to describe both measures that can be initiated by and implemented by energy companies and financial institutions, as well as recommendations for action for politicians that would contribute to closing this finance gap. In the following, I would like to share some results of this analysis. So. It's a fact that the financing of the energy transition is currently largely financed through uh, free cash flow and bank loans. And however, these forms of financing are reaching the limits. The internal financing capability and the debt sustainability, including the balance sheet of energy companies, in many cases do not allow further borrowing. And in addition, an increase in the equity capital base, it's largely exhausted for many companies, and credit financing with very long terms are often no longer representable. And we are talking about infrastructure investments, so they are very long term. But the energy transition not only places enormous challenges on companies, but also on their financing partners, banks and saving banks, for example. So even though 70 to 80 percent of the financing requirements of small and medium sized energy companies in particular, are currently covered by bank loans. They are, and, and there are regulatory limits here for banks as well. It is important to emphasize that the law does prescribe the same regulatory requirements for loans to energy companies as for any other lending. This means in concrete terms that legally no different credit limits or equity requirements can be used just because they expansion of renewable energy is politically and socially desired. So private investments in the energy transition are in competition with conventional investment opportunities and are subject to the same requirements in terms of risk, profitability, and transparency. So the economic viability of energy project, projects must also be assessed and positively determined. And to optimize lending capability, the legislator should urgently review to what extent it can facilitate. In particular, measures that further reduce lending capabilities should be avoided. For example, counter uh, cyclical capital buffer, the sector system risk buffer, sector system risk buffer, the increase of minimum reserve. You, you all know this kind of, let's say, um, requirements. So this needs to be uh, um, yes, optimized from a legislative perspective. In addition, it must be examined which instruments for risk reduction and relief of the risk-bearing equity capital of banks are conceivable. A solution could be targeted state guarantees or the use of suitable capital market instruments. 
For the financing of the energy transition, it will be crucial to what extent, in addition to credit financing, additional private capital flows can be activated by attractive capital market instruments. However, not all companies have equal access to the capital market. So especially small and medium-sized companies often do not have significant access to the capital market, which limits the opportunity to raise further external capital. So often the necessary external rating is lagging or um, any other topics are uh, leading to a insufficient access to capital markets for in particular small and medium businesses. So this is compounded by the higher transaction cost of capital market financing, which can hardly be compensated for in smaller to medium-sized transaction volumes. So to open up additional financing opportunities for small and medium-sized companies, measures are needed to improve their capital market capability. This includes, for example, bundling of project volumes to achieve capital market relevant project financing sizes, which are typically above 500 million. Most of the projects are around 20 to 30 million in um, uh, smaller uh, companies. So we need to bundle the project uh, in order to achieve ticket sizes, which are as affordable for, for the market. Cooperation between small and medium sized utilities, for example, in the form of joint asset companies um, and rating transfers, uh, transfers and things like that, just to get access. And um, uh, last but not least, the most important thing is to um, Yes, risk sharing for refinancing of energy transaction credits through appropriate capital market instruments, such as bundling of individual loans and subsequent passing it um, on wire securitizations. Securitizations, by the way, can strengthen banks' lending cap capacity in the interface between bank-based corporate, corporate financing and the capital market and make uh, a significant contribution to financing the energy transition. This is, of course, quite developed in the US, but in Europe, for example, progress in securitization and the European Capital Market Union must be at the top of the political uh, political agenda, and it is on top of the political agenda, which is super important. So we need a liquid capital market in Europe to master the energy transition and the green transformation. Furthermore, um, it should be examined what possibilities there are to boost banks' financing from the political side. For example, prospectively by reducing the equity capital requirements for investments in the energy transition. So why do we stay to the same level? Why do we not reduce the equity capital requirement for the investments in the energy transition? So let's take a brief look at the investor's perspective. And so private capital providers often lack transparency and certainty about the profitability and the um, stable cash flow during the financing period. And furthermore, the risks uh, associated with green investments are often seen as too high and the returns as too uncertain. So investments in the green energy transition are typically assessed with increased technological, political, regulatory, and financial risks. This leads, from an investor perspective, to an unattractive risk return profile. Let's face it, and directly increase cost of capital. So macro risks like political and regulatory risks are central as they make up 50 to 90% of the cost of capital of current green projects. So based on our last um, uh, global report on financing the green energy transition, de-risking tools can unlock around 40 trillion US dollar of savings through 2015. So investments in the energy transition must have a sufficiently attractive risk return profile. Without an improvement of the risk return profile or additional incentives, incentives, the mobilization of private capital and the required increase in the investment rate cannot be achieved and the energy transition will definitely fail. An improvement of the risk return profile can be achieved through for example, legally framework conditions with a maximum degree of long-term reliability and planning security. This is the biggest issue, that investors are not fully trusted in the strategy and, and the way forward or, uh, in terms of um, yes, uh, uh, regulation, in terms of technology which will be used, etc. So this is super important that there is a stable um, um, legal framework. Second, um, 
the um, sufficient transparency and certainty about the profitability in the investment must be improved, um, which is currently the case because, as you know, the implementation of the regulatory requirements, of course, um, improve transparency and um, uh, in a certain way, certainty about the profitability as well. Risk sharing and de-risking through mixed financing from public subsidies and private capital, so downside protection, things like that. So blended finance, de-risking is super important to improve risk return profile. And uh, government guarantee mechanisms are playing a key role uh, in this context to unleash private investments, for example, by reducing investment risk through first loss insurance and, and, and other measures. Uh, so all companies from the energy sector and the financial institutions that have been part of our study have confirmed that capital costs are becoming a decisive cost factor in the energy transition. In Europe, the EU action plan, which plans steering of capital flows towards sustainable economy, uh, economic activities, which I mentioned, has so far not led to any significant reduction of capital cost for sustainable investments. So this is due, among other things, of course, to the risk costs associated with the financing. Another cost element, by the way, beside risk is the substantial process and bureaucracy cost, um, which um, uh, uh, has to be um, yeah, spared by credit institutions to, due to the EU regulations. And this is exactly where politics need to step in. So one of the most important tasks of politics is to create an investment framework that makes economically attractive energy transition projects possible. And without sufficient long-term reliable returns, both for the energy industry and for private capital providers, the energy transition will not be financeable and will not come about. So in the following, I would like to uh, look at the fields of action for politics from our joint study with all the stakeholders which I mentioned. So first, adjustment of the regulatory framework financing. So the regulatory framework should make financing the energy transition easier, not more difficult for banks and investors. So the application of a reduced equity capital allocation for all energy transition for investments, for example, would be a, 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 a very useful measure. Um, in Institutional investors, such as pension funds and life insurers, are subject to strict rules and, and how uh, on how and where they can invest. So exception clauses for investments in the energy transition, possibly with government protection, could increase a win-win situation as well, as well. The second area where politics need to take action is um, fiscal investment incentives, so to strengthen the financial power of companies. Fiscal investment or instruments um, to support investments in the energy transition should be introduced very quickly from our perspective. So super write-offs, for example, for investments in climate protection, investment premiums and tax credits are e efficient tax instruments to support green investments. Um, <clears throat> tax relief for companies investing in energy transition projects, for example, should be introduced. This uh, could increase the attractiveness, uh, attractiveness of investments in renewable energy and sustainable technologies. So there are some levers in the fiscal um, area which, which we uh, quickly need to introduce. The third topic which we raised is um, target-oriented uh, orientation of promotional funding. That's super interesting, yes, because uh, promotional banks play a specific or special role in financing the energy transition, but um, and, and making access to promotional funds as easy as possible for energy companies is super important because today only 20, I don't know whether it's a global figure, but it's at least a German and yes, closely a, a, a European figure, today 20 to 30 percent of the available funding is thrown down. 70 to 80 percent is not used so far, yes, but the companies are still needing money, but they are not able to or they don't want to to apply for 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 uh, promotional funding. That's um, something that we need to improve. And furthermore, promotional banks has to expand the product range to include equity strengthening forms of financing, such as hybrid or subordinated capital, which is super important uh, for 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 the energy uh, companies. 
Guarantees, as I mentioned already, by the federal or state governments are also important components uh, for the implementation of the energy transition. So de-risking instruments and guarantees are de-risking instruments can partly or fully mitigate some of the risks. So blended finance instruments in which the state reduce the investment risks through guarantees and sureties are an efficient mean of providing the risk return profile and reducing, uh, improving the risk return profile and uh, reducing capital cost for companies. In our last study, we um, estimated that the optimal development of planned finance mechanisms um, are able to reduce cost of green energy up to 35%, which is, which is a lot. Last but not least, energy transition funds. So from our point of view, energy transition funds are of central importance. So the federal government or and or state could set up state energy transition funds that enable public investments to be leveraged. So as a result of our study, we currently set up a state in, in Germany. We currently set up a state guaranteed equity based energy transition fund for institutional investors like insurance companies and pension funds to strengthen the equity position of energy com companies. Because a high equity ratio not only strengthens the balance sheet situation of the companies, but also improves the credit rating for borrowing. And um, because of that, there is a huge potential and lever and today, by the way, institutional investors as a target group for these investments make only 1% of climate investments. So there is a lot of money available, um, uh, which we can directly lead uh, more or less into the transition um, of the energy sector. So as a closing statement, so I come to an end because we want to have time for some uh, questions and answers. Um, as, as most of the discussions are about risks of financing the energy transition, I would like to close with some strategic perspective for banks, because financing the green energy transition presents strategic opportunities for the banks to differentiate itself in the market and tap into new revenue streams. It's not only about risks. By supporting renewable energy projects, sustainable and sustainable initiatives, the bank can drive growth, expand its client base, and differentiate itself in an increasingly competitive market. The furthermore, financing green projects helps the bank align its portfolio, its portfolio with regulatory and policy trends focused on climate action sustainability, of course. This proactive approach can minimize risk related to climate change and future regulation cha regulatory changes while positioning the bank um, to benefit from governmental um, incentives. But what will be decisive, and this is one of the most important takeaways from our exercise with the with the different stakeholders is that all actors need uh, uh, or uh, pull together to cope with this historic task and find the right balance and the mix from the various financing options. In this way, they can work together in an optimal way and reinforce each other. And this is uh, what we are all uh, currently collectively working on, that we bring together all stakeholders in order to get this done. And, and uh, yes. So let me let me let me stop here and pause here and open up um, the um, yes discussion. Thank, thank you very much you. for your attention. Thank you, Hans. Great, great, uh, great talk. Great, great set of great set of points. You know that 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 was an interesting stat. Only one percent of institutional money uh, is in climate investments. That that's you know you you think of the significance of of that investor base. In the capital markets, as opposed to say the re retail inv uh, investor base, and as you said, you said pension funds, insurance companies. You, you think here in the United States, any of the any any state retirement, any state retirement. Uh, I mean, these are huge, you know, Calpers and the like, ERS here in New York. I mean, those those numbers are are, are gigantic as a, as a player. So if they took an interest in it, you know, from a from an investment standpoint, you would think that their voice would be heard, or they could be a significant player in that. Yes, Glenn, and we talk to them, yes, um, in some markets, and they are super interested because we are talking mainly about infrastructure investments with a duration time or financing time or investment time of 20 years or even more. And they are so institutional investors are super interested in putting their money into long term um, investments in order to, to 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 control it yes and, and and to being able to engage if it's needed and things like that. So um, there are a couple of things which 
uh, quite logical in a certain way that um, we should be able, if the risk return profile is attractive enough um, uh, for, for, the, for the investors, that we are able to mobilize um, institutional investors, which would be great because there is a lot of money, as we know. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, you got to know where you come from to know where you're going. And, you, you know, when you think about risk management uh, from a financing standpoint, here with your traditional banks. At some point, the original power grids and infrastructure was built, and they lent on that. So they, and as as perhaps transformative as it is now, the, these types of risks and credit committee decisions, roll the clock back fifty years, eighty years ago, when they were building the initial plans, you would think they would have went through that same process. Oh, do you think this is going to have a return? Oh, what's going to what's going to be what's going to be the risk reward benefit here? Even though it's it's obviously uh, green green technology now, and 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 looking at it that way, you would think that they would have had these similar types of discussions decades ago at a different revolution, and here we are with a you know a new industrial revolution, and it's like, well, come on, step up to the table and let's get a little bit more creative here. So actually, actually, I think the discussions are exactly the same as, as they have been a couple of decades or, or years ago, uh, because we are talking about, let's say, sustainability of an investment at the end. Yes. So um, because now we are talking about that long term investments 10 years ago are not, let's say, affordable anymore. Yes, because they are at risk to be devaluated. Um, in, in in the next couple of years. So this is all about how do I manage my risk for, or my portfolio and the risk with exposure in my portfolio? How do I manage my stranded assets? Yes, uh, because um, as, as as you said, so there will be a de devaluation of, uh, of of existing assets. And, um, and 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 just to mention, I think it's super important that we do not focus too much now on green investments only because we still need the power supply of the existing uh, infrastructure and the existing um, fossil based uh, energy in a certain way and so we need to talk about transition finance in general yes how do we how do we manage the transition from old technology to to, to, to new technology um, with attractive risk return profiles and uh, with let's say manageable um, um, risk, 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 risk exposure in the portfolio, and this is this is a challenge, of course. Yes, but uh, back to your question, uh, from my perspective, the discussions are exactly the same as we had it a couple of years ago, and and you never know whether by, for example, and this is exactly one of the barriers for more investments. How is, for example, the hydrogen strategy? Is it reliable? Is it is it is it really sustainable, or will there be another technology um, in in ten years time of, from now? Yes, nobody knows, and this is this is of course how how banks need to manage their risk all the time in all let's say uh, in uh, 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 asset classes, but uh, in this case this is particular uh, particularly important because we are talking about new technology. Yes, and this is a high risk. Now you you mentioned uh, the annual investment rate needs to be. Uh five times and that yes. and that's just to hit the goals going forward um, absolutely what happens if they fall behind it, how do you, i mean how do you how do you catch back up if if, if there's a slippage then i mean because five you know five 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 on an already you know kind of a foundational number that 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 could be that could be daunting what happens if it slips does it go to six times and seven because you have to play catch up that's what already happened, Glenn. Yeah. So just looking back, I don't know, five years time. So um, it had to, I don't know, be three to four times higher. Now we had five times higher yeah. because yeah. because no, the investment need is not getting getting less. Yes. Yeah? So it's just commun commun com accumulated um, for for the remaining time. So if if we are not able to 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 quickly mobilize capital, as you said, next year it will be six or seven or whatever, and then at the end, um, it's probably highly unrealistic that we will get this done. Yes, because um, the challenge is getting bigger and bigger um, if 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 we are losing time, and that's what we are currently doing. So um, then probably we need to to adjust, and this is already going on. We need to adjust our goals. Now yeah. on the EU, on the EU side, given that it's let, that it's the law here, right? Legally binding yeah. climate requirements. That's got a lot of teeth, I would think, from an investment standpoint, in order Absolutely. to get to get to get to get to these deliverable numbers. And so you, so from that standpoint, the financial institutions in Europe, again, almost yeah. it's it's almost a mandated type of uh, 
lending lending vehicle in, 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 a, in a way, right? As it, it plays is. out. I thought it was interesting what you said about the bundling of projects because you, you think yep. about, especially here in the, sure. in the United States, you think of local local municipalities, local utilities, and maybe they, well, for their community, that's a large number, but if, from a banking standpoint, that might be small. So I, I found that pretty fascinating from a, you know, from a project standpoint, getting grouping similar types of, well, I guess they'd be similar, but maybe not in, into like a bundle type of thing to get, to get the banks even, and then investors more interested. Yes, we had a long discussion um, in, in, in some of our workshops between the energy sector and the financial institutions. Why is it so hard to get money for the smaller projects? Yes, and the, and the, and the banks has been very clear, or the investors has been very clear. This is not attractive from a cost perspective because we have certain costs for doing a transaction. And if the transaction or the ticket size is below 500 million, it doesn't make sense for us to invest because the costs are too high. So, and then we had this discussion around, okay, how do we get uh, the ticket size bigger? And, and we were talking about, okay, um, bundling, um, let's say, standardized kinds of projects. Yes, not everything putting into one bucket or so. It's, it's more about, um, okay, there are, there are projects for, let's say, wind, wind parks or uh, um, um, uh, 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 other, other renewable energy projects. Let's bundle them and then let's, let's, let's achieve a ticket size, which is affordable for the investors. Yes. And this is something which really works already. Yes. So, um, we, we have some examples in the market where, um, we, or, or the energy companies, smaller, medium-sized energy amp companies has been able to, uh, uh, bundle their projects in order to, to get uh, access to capital markets, because now we are talking about a billion or so investment need, and then it's affordable. Well, you mentioned even the government giving you a little bit of a head start from a from a funding standpoint. We just had Special Deputy Director Carla Frisch on from the uh, mm -hmm. Department of Energy, and she was sharing some on the manufacturing side, some of the, some of the investments that the government is putting in, and it's a great way to start the project when you're getting you know twenty to thirty percent, almost as a down payment, or or again not having to then, as you mentioned earlier, having to just rely on free cash flow. You're kind of getting that little bit of a bump here to get to get rolling, and then you know then perhaps your regular free cash flow then keeps. Keeps sustaining that all the way, all the all the way through. Fascinating, fascinating topic. So so many moving parts. Wow, you, I mean, talk about creative solutions. Fantastic work here, uh, Hans. Thank you for for all your leadership and 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 your work here at Deloitte, both here and and, and in Europe as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us here at New York Energy Week. Really appreciated your remarks. Outstanding set, outstanding set, and we, and we wish you a nice weekend. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.